So let's begin the Word of God. Uh, please open your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 9, verses 20 to 25. The book of Acts, chapters, chapter 9, verses 20 to 25. This is the Word of the living God. Now for several days he, that is Saul, was with the disciples who were at Damascus. And immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And those hearing him continued to be astounded and were saying, Is this not the one in Jerusalem who destroyed those who called on his name and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that this one is the Christ. And when many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together to put him to death. But their plot became known to Saul. So they were watching the gates day and night so that they might put him to death. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through the wall, lowering him in a large basket. This is the testimony of Saul. And as we continue with Saul, also known as Paul, and I'm probably going to go back and forth today as, as we preach, but we're talking about Saul, his conversion and testimony. Saul, who was the church destroyer, who came to capture Christians, is now captured by Christ. Saul, the murderer, who went binding, is now bound to Christ. Saul, the persecutor, who is an agent of the Sanhedrin, is now an agent of the Spirit. And Saul, the oppressor, who was searching for Christians under the authority of the chief priests, is now searching for Christians under the authority of the chief priest. And praise God, this terror of the church has now become part of the body of Christ. He shares in the body of Christ. He's now our beloved brother. He's now Saul the Christian. The New Testament repeats this story at least five times in Acts and Galatians and 2 Corinthians. And I couldn't find any other apostolic story that is echoed or repeated as much as this section we're going to talk about today. This frequent recurrence means that there's something significant for the church to be learning in this passage. So we need to be very cognizant of what is being told here and what is being taught here. And before we begin, I I, I do want to address kind of, I think, a temptation that we have to over-spiritualize Paul to make him something more than just a man. Paul was very human, very human. He had a human mother and a human father. He got sick like we do. He got hurt like we do. He had fears like we do. He ate like we do, slept like we do. He rested as we do. He enjoyed being around his friends like we do. And he also sinned like we do. Paul is not perfect. He's also received the mercy and forgiveness and grace that God has given us. That is the same thing that Paul is shared. And that's that's what has transformed Paul is God's grace. And there's nothing that our brother Paul does in this section that we're going to talk about today that we could not do this afternoon. He's just a man. And at the resurrection, Paul will be gazing in the same direction that we are towards Jesus Christ. Paul is a redeemed sinner and dwelled with the Holy Spirit who is given the mission to proclaim the gospel to the nations. And do you know who that sounds like? That sounds like the church. It sounds like you and I. We are redeemed sinners and dwell by the Holy Spirit who have been told to proclaim the gospel to the nations. The big difference between Paul and us is that Paul is actually following through on his mission. Paul is being obedient in his mission in his mission. Yes, Christ gave it to him directly, but he also gave it to us directly in the Great Commission. Now let's be heartened by the Word of God. And we're going to go uh, line by line this morning, and we're going to uh, kind of expose the text line by line. This is the transformation of Paul, and he preaches Christ. Now for several days he that Saul was with the disciples who were at Damascus. And immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. In Acts 8, we learn that uh, most of the apostles that that we know, kind of the Big 12, stayed in Jerusalem. So when he's meeting up with these disciples, he's not talking about what we call the 12, the main 12. These are other faithful and learned and um, obedient believers of Christ. Um, The original word in the Greek is methetes, which means someone who has put forth the mental energy to learn the doctrines of Christ and lives a life according to those doctrines, according to faith in Jesus Christ. And and, and why would he start in the synagogues? 
you have to remember that up to this point, the Christian movement was dominantly Jewish. That's why Paul, in nearly every missionary journey that we see in the New Testament, starts his gospel proclamation in new towns in the synagogue. And if, if, if you revert to the Old Testament, you think, well, well, how do these people get spread out? Aren't, aren't all God's people in Jerusalem or around Israel? Well, no, they have been scattered through a series of persecutions, conquests. The Jews have been scattered. And at that time, for those who were scattered, they probably thought that this was some sort of judgment. There's no good reason that we've been uh, scattered down to the world. But God used this so that Paul would actually have fertile ground in every city that he visited. There would be someone who had the religious background and the scriptural knowledge of the Old Testament to know what Paul was referencing and what he was talking about. This was a strategic place to start, and it was definitely divinely orchestrated. None of the apostles went out to create something new or original, but instead they were declaring the fulfillment of something ancient and expected, that the Messiah has arrived. This should be the biggest news whenever, whenever you would come to a synagogue. The Messiah has arrived. He's come. He's, it's real. It's happened. The prophecies have been fulfilled that, uh, that were written thousands or you know, centuries and thousands of years ago. It's come true. This is real. It's happened. This should be the most uh, ecstatic and exciting thing that is being proclaimed in these synagogues. But sadly, the fulfillment of these didn't satisfy what most of the first century uh, Jews were anticipating. From some of my research, it, it looks like best case scenario, maybe about one in three Jews actually converted to, uh, to Christianity or, or maintain their faith in Christianity. And uh, if that sounds kind of rough, um, the same numbers for the Gentiles just within the Roman Empire is about one in 500. And that, that's the best case numbers. Now, I want you to notice something. Immediately after Saul regains his sight, he begins proclaiming that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That is an extraordinary claim. It's something that I think in the synagogues they were not expecting. They, they could wrap their mind around a Messiah, but this Messiah was the Son of God. That, that's normal for us because we've been raised in a very culturally Christian, if you're in church, that, that's not a shocking claim to hear that someone is the Son of God. But that confession, being common to us, should still be something that amazes us. And are we meditating on that proclamation that Jesus is the Son of God? And we ought to. But why? Because that claim is the fundamental distinction of the Christian faith as we know it today. That Jesus is the Son of God. Who is Jesus to you? When our Lord asked Peter... Who do you say that I am? What was Peter's response? What was the response that Christ said, this is how I'm going to build my church with this proclamation, that Jesus is the Son of God? That's the distinction of the Christian faith, and probably the most essential summation of what we believe as Christians is this, that Jesus is the Son of God. Now think about the, the, the kind of timeline leading up to Saul's uh, missionary journey in Damascus and his proclamation in the synagogue. I, I think we often miss this. What charge did the Jewish, breeders, Jewish leaders bring to our Lord to kill him? Well, that Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. What charge did the uh, Jewish crowds stone Stephen with? Well, that Stephen claimed to be the Son of God. What is the church's proclamation in Jerusalem that results in this massive persecution that pushed them out? that Jesus was the Son of God. So this confession has a history of violent death associated with it and really the months leading up to what happened to Saul here. And what does Saul do? He walks right into the synagogues, into these cauldrons of persecution, where everyone is expecting Saul to announce the crushing domination of Christians, where confession of Christ results in death, and he declares, Jesus is the Son of God. There's a strong case, I think, here for a bold and fearless declaration of Christ and declaration of the gospel. But yet I also see Paul here being someone who's been so transformed by God's love and God's grace that he can't help risking his own life to go talk to these lost people, to try to find them. And he's willing to lose everything, including his own life, to preach the gospel to them. Paul writes in Romans later that he wishes for his own damnation if somehow he could 
trade places with his kinsmen, that they would come into Christ. That's a deep love that we have to, to look at. And I, I would ask, are, are we taking that same self-abandonment and that same agape to our neighbors here in Eufaula in Oklahoma? Do we have that type of desire and, and, and necessity to tell people about Christ because he so transformed us? We have to share this with someone else. Again, I pray we do. The transformation of Saul becomes hunted. Verse 21. And those and all those hearing him continue to be astounded and were saying, is this not the one who in Jerusalem destroyed those that called on this name who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? And who, who is speaking here, by the way? This is a very hostile, anti-Christian crowd. Notice they say, bring them bound, speaking this name. They're taken back by Paul. That's what this astounded means. And I, I can see these people saying, what, what has happened to Saul? We were counting on this rising champion of the Pharisees to crush the Christians, to crush the way. Saul was an emerging leader within kind of the Pharisee community. He was a brilliant scholar. So the Jews, in particular the Pharisees, wouldn't have expected him to convert to this kind of dispersed, backwoods Galilean sect. They're on the run. They're, the, the, the Christians at this point are losing. They're on the run. They're, they're, they're running away from, from the larger community that they're, that they're with. In fact, this synagogue, if you remember the, the previous uh, section we read about in Acts, probably has the letter or the intent from the Jerusalem temple, from the Sanhedrin saying, we're sending Saul up here and he's going to crush the Christians. That was their expectation when he came to the synagogues as he's going to announce persecution. They expected Saul the Pharisee. They did not expect Saul the Christian. And if you observe, th this group doesn't say Jesus' name. It, it's, it's silent in this section. They're calling on this name over here. They won't say Jesus' name. I think a portion of that is that there is the power of life and death in the name of Christ. His, his name, we, we call him Jesus in English. In Hebrew, it's Yeshua, or God's salvation, God's deliverance. And if you use those terms and you're, and you're saying those terms, something may get connected in your mind to start connecting the dots on this is God's salvation. And I, I want you to kind of reflect on some of the social shifts taking place here. Saul showed up with a group of people that were coming to murder Christians. It was a violent posse that was coming to hunt down this on-the-run group of radicals. With the authority and blessing of the chief priest, they came to deliver violence to the church in Damascus. And I, I don't think we often appreciate that Saul knew that starting now with this proclamation that Jesus is the Son of God, that those assassins were going to be coming for him now. Especially after this embarrassment to the Pharisees. They sent this guy with their blessing, with their authority. And what does he do? He completely subverts this message. Not only is, is he not persecuting the church, he's encouraging the church. He's proclaiming the church's victory in Damascus. There's no turning back now for Saul. He's very alone. Verse 22. But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that this one is the Christ. Saul was being empowered to preach Christ. And this is a different type of empowerment, a different type of strengthening than Eric preached on last week. Eric's strength that he talked about was he ate bread and he was physically recovering. But what's happening to Jesus here is he is being indwelled with the Holy Spirit and charged by God to proclaim the gospel. His mind and his soul are now being divinely moved to prove that the Messiah, this guy we're expecting, is Jesus Christ. And how, how would you prove the fulfillment of prophecy? How would you do that? I think for Saul, it's by connecting all the ancient revelation in Scripture about the Messiah, about the Christ, and how they have blossomed in Jesus. You know, the, the, God often uses our pre-conversion circumstances, our, our pre-conversion experiences, especially for a new believer, for tremendous purposes. We often don't know why God just didn't make us Christians from the womb. Why did we just weren't birthed as Christians? Why well, we have to live for a while in the world as the world before Christ calls us. 
But there is a reason that Christ brings us at the time that he does. Christian, I, I want you to remember that who you were before God delivered you will be used. So that God in his magnificent power and his mysterious purposes is going to cultivate something from you. God is going to be glorified all the richer because of who you were before you were called. He's going to use your past for his kingdom's future. And if you are Christ's, you have been deliberately chosen for a purpose in him. Something that is going to be eternally meaningful. God employed Saul's massive knowledge of the Tanakh as a rabbinical student in a Pharisee community with this fresh understanding, this fresh realization of who Jesus is. God used Saul's life experience to make for one of the most potent evangelists ever. This man who hated the church is now the one uh, being the reckoning of the church, the one exploding the church into these new locations where it could never be touched. And uh, this transformation of Paul or Saul reminds me of a, a short version of a poem by a Christian dissident named uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn. And it reminds me of Paul. Uh, and it reminds me of, I think, possibly some of our walks, talking with some people in this church about how we have come to find Christ. Looking back with grateful trembling at the life I had to lead, neither desire nor reason has illuminated its twists and turns. But the glow of a higher meaning only later to be explained. I scoop up the water of life with the cup of Christ that has returned to me. Thou remained when I denied. Almighty God, I believe in thee. I want you to think about this, and there, there's some discussion on the timelines from this section of Scripture we're in. But it's very probable that Saul had no church support, no church structure at this time. Ananias helped him out, but Saul's probably not a, a, a really connected and well a network member of a church community at this point. This church is under persecution, and it's a new community. Saul was likely very alone in his early Christian walk, and undoubtedly he lost friends and these people who, who were giving him support from Jerusalem. The Christians are terrified of him. The Jews hate him. Are we, as the Christian church, providing the type of adoptive family that a new convert can be brought into? Are we providing the type of sport for those who have, have been yanked out of the worst of situations and that they feel included in this Christian family that we find ourselves in? I certainly believe we're called to it. Verse 23. And when many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together to put him to death. But their plot became known to Saul. And they were watching the gates day and night so that they might put him to death. Saul is being transformed here, not only in Christ, not, not only at, at the spiritual level, but also the social relationships are shifting. He's now no longer a member of the synagogue. He is, he is, is becoming something different. He, that, that's no longer his support system. He's now been cut off from the synagogue. And he's now went from Paul the persecutor to Paul the persecuted. Uh, all these things are shifting. Paul's, Saul's life at this point is basically falling apart outside of, of Christ moving in him. His, all, all his connections are falling apart. And the synagogue couldn't accept Saul's preaching of Christ and his lordship. Saul was highly educated in the Tanakh and could probably out-debate anyone in that room who tried to challenge him on, is Jesus the Christ? So when you can't use your words to defeat someone, what are you left with? Violence. Uh, the Christian hunting posse that Saul came with swayed the ruler of the city, King Aretas, into arresting Paul and, and starting to persecute the Christians. Um, so you, you not only have this local synagogue where, and, and this local Jewish community now attacking Saul and trying to go after the Christians here, but then also the government, which, which we don't believe was a Jewish government, it was a, a Gentile government. They're now chasing the church as well. So you have these religious zealot mobs chasing you, and now you have professional military. You have the city's guards are looking for you as well. And notice in the text, it says that they are watching the gates day and night. Saul is trapped. He can't get out. The only way that you can get out of a walled city is through the gates. And if you're Saul, 
Everyone in this group that that hates you in this community, by the way, now knows what you look like because you were preaching in the synagogues boldly. They can all say, oh, that's the guy. A lot of these guys that are looking for him could have possibly been on these death squads that he was bringing up as well. I mean, these were people with zealous hatred for the church. And they all know Saul. They know what he's like. They know what he likes to talk about. They know his personality before he was converted. They, they were marching up together from Jerusalem. So they know Saul. They know what he looks like. They know how he acts. And they're out looking for him. And I, I don't want you to think of this, this kind of walled section in Damascus as this just colossal complex that stretches for you know dozens of miles. To, to give you a good walkthrough of, of, of what archaeologists think that the actual wall looks like, it goes from about here and you fall off from about where Brent's gun shop's at to the amphitheater. It's not big. You, you, can, you can walk it, the perimeter, in about 30 minutes. This is not a big place to hide. And they only have about half a dozen gates as well, so it's pretty easy to lock down the city once the word's out that we're looking for Saul. Now, the text isn't definitive on what is meant by watching the gates so they could put him to death. Does that mean with daggers to just quickly assassinate him? Does it mean that to capture him, to take him bound to Jerusalem for a, a blasphemy trial? Or to grab him quickly, like happened with Stephen, and stone him outside the gates? I, uh, I, I guess it really doesn't matter because none of these are positive outcomes for Saul. And so, so I want to hit this point, though. Saul was likely very involved in the acceptance, approval, observation, and possibly even the direct action of stoning Christians. Uh, I'll share this very quickly. Uh, when I was on a, a reconnaissance mission in very rural, um, mountainous Afghanistan, I, I witnessed uh, a man and a woman being stoned to death. And there is nothing that can take that out of your mind once you see something like that. You see um, blue clothes turn purple. Right? You, you hear stones crushing facial bones. I mean, this is... This is brutal, and, and a violent death has a uh, has a smell that you don't ever forget. When, when humans die violently, and it's it, it's just something you'll never forget. When I think about it, I, I want to throw up even to this day. Stoning is a brutal way to die. So martyrdom isn't an abstract thing to to Saul. He knows what he's going to experience in a distinctively real way. Guys, I want you to think about this that. Saul was traveling to Damascus with a group of men to do this very same thing to Christians. And now it's going to have to happen to him. He, he knows the brutal fanaticism and zealous hatred he's going to face if he's captured. Christ died. Stephen died. A lot of the church in Jerusalem died. They are coming to kill these Christians. Saul knows what's coming for him right now. This is very real to Saul. And somehow Saul finds out about all this. And we don't have the details on how it happened, um, but I'm going to be looking at some of the evidence that suggests that a member of the church, the underground church, just overheard this somehow, whether they're still working in the synagogues and they overheard it, um, and the church's intelligence function kicked in. The underground church went up to Saul and said, uh, we got to get you out of here. They're looking for you. They know what you look like, and they know you're within this part of the city. Actually, in Damascus, there was a Jewish quarter in the southeast section that Saul was likely hanging around. It's, it's not a big part of the area. And so the church is trying to get you out of here so you can keep preaching the gospel. They know Saul's importance. Saul may have gone for the gate out of the Jewish section first. That gate would have, have went to the east. And then as he's walking up, he freezes. His adrenaline kicks and this hair is sticking up on his neck when he sees these men that he was coming up to, to murder Christians with are now looking for him. When he realizes those people kill Christians and I'm a Christian now. What are you going to do? This guy is looking to kill you. These men are looking to kill you. Quickly and quietly, he may have moved to the next gate. Same thing. And to the next gate. And to the next gate. And to the next gate. You comprehend your situation and you realize you are trapped in the city. And there are probably men roving through the town too, these professional guards who are looking to kill you as well under King Aretas' authority. And you got to do something soon. 
Time is not your friend if you are trapped in a city and there's people looking for you. I'm sure there are a lot of fear and praying right now from the church in Damascus. Not only from Saul, but also the local church. And, and I think we talk about the underground uh, church in denied areas today, places where you wouldn't have the freedom to preach Christ openly and boldly without massive repercussion. But friends, there's always been an underground church in history. That's, it's always existed. And that's a group of Christians who must be very careful and secretive in order to save your fellow Christian's life. This may be something that we need to look at as a church at some point in the future. What does an underground church look like in America in 2030? And if that seems drastic, um, consider this, that from 1915 to 1920, the largest, at least Christ-acknowledging empire in Europe, the Russian Empire, that's five years, went from, again, at least a Christ-acknowledging monarchy to an antichrist state. And over the next 60 or 70 years, somewhere along the lines of uh, 60 million Christians were swallowed up by both their government and their neighbors. How an underground church functions may be something to think about before we need to think about them. Last section. The church rescues Saul. Verse 25. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through the walls, lowering him in a large basket. And friends, if I had one verse to preach on in Acts 9, this is the verse that I would want to preach on. I could talk about this verse for days and days and days and days and not exhaust all the meanings that we find in this verse. There are a lot of types and parallels here that we don't have time to expose today. There's a lot of history and discussion and timelines and and and, and imagery of the Hebrew spies in Jericho, of Noah's Ark, the Hebrew mother lowering her son Moses into the Nile to save him from uh, tyrannical murderers. And we're going to save that for a future discussion. Uh, so I want to step past some of these connections to talk about what I think is the most essential message right here for the Christian church. And I'll, I'll reread this verse, and I want you to try to see this in your mind and build on it as we discuss it. But his disciples took him by night and let him down through the wall, lowering him in a large basket. This kind of strange detail in the story is the apex of Christian communion. The most heartbreaking and encouraging example of Christian brotherhood and promise is something we often read this and quickly move through as just kind of a transition point in Saul's plot, Saul's, Saul's story. Later in Acts, we discover that uh, Caiaphas gave Saul a letter uh, written to the brethren in Damascus. And, and what does that mean? That means that those hunting the Christians likely knew who many of the Christians were in Damascus. They had a list of names they were looking for because many of the Christians in Damascus were uh, dispersed out of Jerusalem when the uh, persecution kicked off after Stephen was stoned. Now, we know from Luke's account in Acts that the apostles stayed actually near Jerusalem. Um, but it doesn't look like the Sanhedrin knew that. There's, there's an early church writing, and it's not infallible, that suggests that Saul was going to Damascus deliberately to kill Peter. That was his target, according to this early church writing. So I, I want you to, as we, as we move through this next section, I, I do want you to think about yourself as one of these persecuted religious refugees who has been shot out and you're hiding in Damascus. I want you to have that framework and understand kind of the background of, of what this text is talking about. That you know that there are roaming patrols of men who are looking to slaughter Christians in Damascus. All the gates are sealed off. They're looking for Christians. And if you're caught and you profess Christ as King, Christ as Lord, Christ as God, you and your family are going to be slaughtered. But you know what? The church in this, in this risk, did not abandon Paul. Paul, who was sticking his neck out and drawing a lot of uh, kind of maybe unwanted attention for the church, Saul, who, who many at that time would probably say, well, he's being foolish and reckless, was protected by an unfunded and underground 
an unorganized group of religious refugees. This underground church, who had everything to lose, by the way, it's not as though they have a, a, a special, you know, side life or, or something that they can do to escape. They had everything to lose. Right now, they're keeping their their head underground. They're, they're keeping their heads low. They had everything to lose, and they say to Saul, "No, brother, we're not forsaking you, even if it means that we lose our lives in the process." These men, whose names are forgotten, but all by God, took a tremendous amount of risk, who went above and beyond the call of duty to deliver the man who came to murder their families. The term took him in verse 25 suggests that they found Saul and physically seized him as part of this initiation of a rescue. They, they, they grabbed Paul and hoisted him away. I can see Paul wanting to stay behind and say, no, I'm, I'm with you guys in this. I'm not leaving. But these, I think these men understood there was something unique about what Saul was doing, about this mission he was giving. So lowering him in a basket, by the way, is, is a perilous choice, especially at night. If a guard or a Pharisee caught you, you and Saul are dead. The men that are with you are dead. If you're, if you're on top of a wall and you're trying to move someone out of it, you really can't just leap over the side. I mean, these are, you know, tens of feet tall. If, if you jump down, you're going to break your leg and they're going to find you and they're going to exploit your network and they're going to kill the church. And this isn't an isolated event. We know that there is a terrible persecution going on across Damascus looking for these men, for this church. Christians right now within the city walls are looking for a way out. Every one of these men is trapped inside of Damascus. And the point is this, that if you are lowering Saul in a basket, you know who isn't leaving? You. A willingness to sacrifice yourself for another Christian, a true understanding of Christ's charge to his friends, of this is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. What we see here is this is the risk associated with Christian agape here, with Christian love. Beloved, there, there are many Christians who stayed behind so that Paul could live. There are Christians who courageously stood at the wall with tearful goodbyes in their eyes who said, Brother, you have to keep telling people about Jesus. And if we don't see you in this life, if, if, if we don't make it out of Damascus, we'll see you at the resurrection. God's with us. We'll see you. And we don't know what happened to this church, this unnamed group of men who, who risked it all to save Saul. Paul often mentions his friends and his kind of compatriots uh, in his letters to other churches. Ananias, who, who was with him in his conversion, is never mentioned again. The church in Damascus isn't mentioned in any historical writings for another 80 years. And we don't know if these men went back underground and survived the persecution, or if they forfeited their lives to save their friend. But they have the same hope we do. In Jesus Christ. God often works things that we don't understand. God's dispersion of the Jews into this into this area up through Damascus and, and through most of the, the Near East may have seemed like a, a a a punishment or a judgment, but we see this working so that 
Centuries later, this group of men, excuse me, would be there to rescue Saul. Saul, the man who came hating the church and hoping to destroy the church, is now being rescued by the church. And is that not an image of some of us, brothers? Following Christ means counting your life as loss every single day. It's the most challenging thing I've ever done. But once you understand that he has called you with his love and his grace, that there's no going back. If Christ has called to rescue you, you are free. And who the Son sets free, you're free indeed. Let's pray. Father, you are a rock in our salvation, our deliverance. You've got our ways on paths that are true. You catch us when we fall. You've given us a family in your church that overcomes the gates of hell. I ask you to remember your church and empower us to proclaim Christ, to be transformed into your image, and to remind us to love one another as you have loved us. I ask this in your name and for your glory. Amen.